All right, I want to talk about this story. I want everyone to raise your, your right hand right now and pledge allegiance to the climate gods. Go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. Raise your hand. Uh, you're going to have to do this if you want to graduate college and get a good job. I'm not making this up. Listen to this crazy story, which is just really the tip of the iceberg. So um, here is the story that um, really the Daily Skeptic did an amazing job. Austin Williams wrote this story. Why is the Architects Registration Board insisting on fealty to climate change orthodoxy as a condition of qualifying as an architect? Okay, what does that mean? It looks like an article that most people would probably just ignore and maybe zip past because you're like, oh, I don't know what that means. But but I think it's an amazing window in how these globalists want to change our lives. So let me peel the onion back on this story a little bit. In order to become an architect who designs buildings and homes, you will basically ne now need to swear a blood oath to the climate gods that you will both design and build your buildings using sustainable materials that have been sanctioned by the government. If I don't pledge allegiance... To these climate gods, you will not be certified as an architect. And you will never work in the industry. You will be like blackballed and outcast. I'm not making this up. That would like that's kind of like telling a medical school student that in order to become a doctor, they must agree that they will only use government sanctioned sustainable tools in the operating room or medical devices that are sustainable, right? Oh, wait, you mean this heart valve is the best one on the market? It will likely save this patient's life, but it's not sustainable, so I can't use it. So I have to use your crappy version that's made of sugar cane, and it'll dissolve inside the body after six years. But at least it's good for the environment that the patient will die. But we can feel, we can feel good that that sugar cane heart valve has dissolved. Like, that's literally what we're talking about here. Okay, so they want you to pledge allegiance to the climate gods that you will pledge that you're going to build sustainably. You're going to use a whole host of sustainable building products. Otherwise, you won't be allowed to become an architect or a builder. And it's only a matter of time, by the way, before this catches on to every other industry. And stop me if, if, I'm, if I'm wrong, but or maybe I am wrong. Let me know in the chat. Are there other industries where you're already seeing this type of like pledge allegiance to, otherwise you're not going to be able to practice in the way that we have for hundreds of years. I'd be curious. Let me know. If any of them come to mind, let me know. So where did this Hopefully come from? they don't start to move toward that with the bug, the bug movement, you know, eating bugs. I pledge allegiance, I pledge to eating bugs for the future, well, for sustainability. They already are in schools, so they're probably a part of it. So where did all this come from? I mean, this it came from the same clowns that David was just talking about, like at the World Economic Forum and the United Nations. Um, it was born out of something called Agenda 21. Now, for those of you, you have to go back to 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. More than 178 countries adopted what was known as Agenda 21, which was a comprehensive global plan for sustainable development to improve human lives and to protect the environment. That was just the starting point. Now, what you're seeing here on your screen is the second step. Then the United States, the United Nations in 2015 rolled out in part two of this, something called the 17 goals, which took this a step further. You'll notice at the top of this list on your screen, number one is uh, end poverty, no poverty. I think we could all agree, agree on no poverty. Number two was zero hunger with a bowl of ramen. Good health and well-being and quality education are also on the top of the list. But the problem is when you go further down the list to say number 12 on the list, you have responsible consumption and production. That's the next slide. Responsible consumption and production, number 12. And sustainable cities and communities, number 11. And reduced inequalities, number 10. So there are a number of items here that make achieving no poverty and zero hunger virtually impossible because they're contradictory. When you take away fossil fuels, hydrocarbons that eliminate poverty, create safe buildings for people during hurricanes and other big problems, the reason we have almost no, no people dying, very few, I mean, the, the percentage of people dying nowadays, of course, from natural disasters is dramatically lower than it was in the 1920s, which was the height of climate disasters, right? Or, or, I want to say climate disasters, natural disasters. Yes, climate-related disasters. So yeah. 1920 was the height of it, right? Yes. And now it's like less than, fewer than 1%. Um, and so it's a dr dramatic shift 
in deaths as a result of climate or natural disasters. Well, yes, the news media tells you that there are, there's more that there's more expensive damage than ever before, uh, but that's because we've put more things in the path of hurricanes, buildings, stores, that right. kind of thing. Uh, but most of those buildings and stores usually hold up because of the way we build them right now and it makes it safer for humans to live in these areas uh, so you know you have to ask the question does do we compromise the sort of integrity of a building in order to you know meet these climate goals michael in our chat says contrast the galveston hurricane with today's oh yeah yeah galveston was set to become the next new york city as a port right the major port in the united states destroyed never recovered never recovered that was what 1901 was the galveston hurricane maybe i'm wrong check, let, fact check me on that in the chat but uh excellent book on that book uh by the way isaac's storm if you ever want to read an excellent book on the the galveston hurricane um isaac's storm who, uh, was really fascinating take on that um anyway so yeah when you start when you, these contrasting things you want to end poverty right you want to get rid of you want to um, end hunger but at the same time, you want to take away fossil fuels and hydrocarbons and force people to get solar panels and electric cars. You actually are, you can't achieve that because what you're doing is you're actually sending more people into poverty. So your 17 steps won't work the way it's laid out. And recently that's become apparent. In fact, they use these 17 goals. They found out that they're not in alignment at all. And the whole plan is a mess. In a report out this morning, November 17th, 2022, the United Nations is quietly acknowledging that these 17 goals clash into one another. Facing up to shortfalls and trade-offs in the Sustainable Development Goals. Well, these 17 Sustainable Development Goals need rescuing, a global sustainable investors group warned recently. They're a collection of 17 goals, but they've got problems. So I'm quoting now. The, SG, the SDGs are a collection of 17 goals, blah, 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 but they are in peril, says the article. The yearly gap in financing of the SDGs for developing countries is estimated at 2.5 to 3.6 trillion per year because these things don't work. $3.6 trillion per year because this doesn't work. So we're just wasting that money. So in order to hit this goal, they need to spend $3.6 trillion. Imagine what we could do with that kind of money if it was being spent correctly, investing in, say, nuclear energy power around the world, for example. Just think what we could do with that money instead of wasting it on this garbage. So when I saw this architect report, I thought, hmm, has anyone stopped to ask the question as to whether or not these products actually work or not? Or are they, in fact, sustainable at all? After all, these architects and these builders are being told to use these things where they can no longer build, meaning that we're told that these new types of bricks or these new forms of drywall or these new sustainable insulation are great for building or the environment. But has anyone asked if they actually work to build the properties like regular products? And are they, in fact, any more sustainable you know, than the stuff we've been using for decades, like bricks or, I don't know, uh, shingles or paint or i mean i don't know like i'm just thinking like what you're just saying words i'm just thinking like i'm just trying to think of the most mundane stuff we've been using since like the flintstones you know like rocks like so is it more sustainable wood there's one wood they have a problem with wood well actually uh recently i can't remember where i read this national geographic or something did a report about how we have a shortage of sand which we need to make things like concrete and, and roads, you know, when you mix sand um, and the world is like may run out of that. So we need some kind of Oh, maybe there you go. Well, maybe you found the answer then. Maybe that's why we can't use normal stuff anymore. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe you cracked it. I don't know. Well, it turns out a lot of people are asking these very same questions. And it also turns out that a lot of consumers are not happy with a lot of the sustainable products, mostly because they don't work as well as the products we've been using for years. By the way, how are we, we going to run out of sand? <laughs> like, really? Okay. Go, you know what? Go to your kid's kindergarten and go in the sandbox. 
there's plenty of sand. That's um, not a point, but okay. I wouldn't. Yeah, I would not want to touch that sand. That's right. how you get hand to foot disease. You're right. You get quite hand cox, to mouth coxsackie disease. Ham. Don't touch a kid's sandbox. Um, so that could be why, because of all these problems now with these sustainable products, that could be why the United Nations is trying to hide the climate data and the problems with sustainability products by altering our search results in Google. Uh, remember this lady from the United Nations. She's on the sustainable development panel. She's part of the impact meetings on sustainable products. She's literally telling us how they censor search results. So when you go to find out if, hey, these things are sustainable in your home, you're going to have buried search results. Thanks to the United Nations. Watch. You know, we partnered with Google, for example. If you Google climate change, you will at the top of your search, you will get all kinds of UN resources. We started this partnership when we were shocked to see that when we Googled climate change, we were getting incredibly distorted uh, information right at the top. So we, we're becoming much more proactive. Um, you know, we own the science and we think that the world, you know, should know it. And, and the platforms themselves also do. Um, but again, it's, it's, it is, um, it's, it's a huge, huge challenge that I think all sectors of society need to be very active in. Yeah, have you ever gone to a desert? Go to the desert. Have you seen, I mean, anyway, I don't know if you've seen the latest uh, uh, John Wick movie where he's in the desert. There's a lot of sand there. You can go find a lot of sand. This is not science. <laughs> Isn't the science. Sahara all sand? I think so. Um, so she's, she's part of the sustainability project. Let, she's telling you how she's partnering with Google to modify search results. So when you want to go and find out about type of building materials, you're not going to find it because it's buried, hidden. Let's hide the data in our search results so people can't ask questions. Let me Google the question, is, sustainable, you know, is sustainably made insulation better than regular insulation for my house? No results were found. I wonder why. Thanks, lady. Have you ever used sustainable laundry detergent or sustainable dishwasher detergent? There's a reason your dishes come out of the dishwasher still dirty with still a piece of salmon stuck to the side of the fork. Uh, because you don't rinse your stuff before you no, put it no, in the dishwasher. No. That's why. No, it's because this shit doesn't work. <laughs> uh, because somebody no, no, puts no. the don't peanut de no, butter. Don't, don't, don't derail it. it. It's because this stuff doesn't work. When you use real detergent or real dishwashing liquid that we've been using for decades, it gets what are the, you talking it about? It gets the peanut butter off the damn knife. No, I'm it doesn't. You. Yes, it does. People waste more money then cleaning the dishes a second time. So they take it out. They use this like sustainable dishwashing gel or whatever the hell it is that doesn't clean anything. Even the hard stuff does not take peanut butter off the knife. You have to wipe all right, all right. it. Enough Please, with the peanut everybody. butter. That, I will never stop Enough until this. Enough with the peanut stuff. butter. But the, the stuff doesn't work. So then you what, the problem is you take it out of the dishwasher and then you wash it a second time and therefore you're using twice as much water. So it's actually worse for the environment when you use half of this stuff. Oh, look, all of you our forks and knives. my nightmare. Yes. All of our forks and knives Jennifer are still dirty. Has the, all these... Yeah, she has this uh, like sustainable, I don't know what it is, but they're these little dishwasher pods and they like crumble when you just touch them and you put them in and they don't do, I, I, every dish comes out like not clean. I'm yeah. like, why are we, we they're, and they're more expensive. Yeah, they're more <laughs> yeah. expensive. They're more, we're going to get into that. They're more expensive. They don't work. And then you have to use more water to clean them again. Great for the environment. <laughs> yeah, and also, um, when you, if you've ever had your machine serviced by a machine repairman or just like do regularly scheduled service on your machine, they'll tell you don't use powder in your machines. It basically rips apart the machines. You want you want liquid. So those little like powdery things, I was using them too. And then you see half of it is still there. Yeah. When you open the dishwasher, because it hasn't completely dissolved, and then the dishes are all still dirty. This, yes, I understand. It's a scam. It's I've a scam. There. Anyway, this go, this whole soap story is just an anecdote for you. But it turns out that a lot of people have been asking these types of questions about these products for years, so that the research is now being conducted so they can come up with a plan on how to talk you into using these products, even if they don't necessarily work. As this new research paper just released this summer describes, it's called sustainability when sustainability backfires. This is a crazy research project that I dove through this morning and it's unbelievable. And it looks at the negative perceptions of these sustainable products and how they try to talk you into using them. Here's a quote from the study. 
to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Goal number 12, which remember was the sustainability part of that, remember number 12, to ensure sustainable consumption and production, a thorough understanding of potential unintended negative side effects of sustainability is essential. Such understanding enables the development of effective mitigation measures. Companies can take action to avoid negative side effects or even turn the risk of their sustainability action backfiring into a positive by leveraging it to increase demand. The required understanding of why negative side effects of product or service sustainability occurred, however, has not yet been developed. <laughs> so you get that? The required understanding of why negative side effects of product or service sustainability occur, however, has not yet been developed. Many key questions about the mechanisms that lead to negative side effects of sustainability remain unanswered in these existing literature, which is highly, highly fragmented and spreads across a wide range of diverse business disciplines. The report explains how consumers are often skeptical that these new sustainable products even work as well as the stuff they've been buying for years. And the report highlights how researchers basically ignore the negative impacts of sustainable products. Instead, they only highlight the good stuff. Let me quote from the study. The number of publications increased rapidly after the year 2012. See figure number one. And studying the negative impact of sustainability was increasingly identified as a key research agenda for the future. Yet overall, the number of studies investigating this topic remains low. The, ma the maximum number of papers published in one single year across all disciplines was 11. In terms of academic fields, more than half of the studies included in this new review appeared in marketing journals. So they're all focused on marketing, how to market this stuff to you. So basically, we don't want to know if these sustainable products even work. Don't ask questions. That's basically the bottom line. The study then goes on to identify ways that companies can hide the downsides of sustainable products while at the same time talking about the benefits. Like, hey, we know this sustainable soap won't clean your dishes, but don't you feel better about yourself? Like, that's literally how they sell it. And here's part of the research issue. The synthesis of 94 articles identifies three main cognitive mechanisms. Um, information elaboration, product perception bias, and self-perception. And several emotionally adverse states, including anxiety, shame, guilt, regret, distress, reduced enjoyment, frustration, discomfort, stress, and embarrassment that are responsible for the unattended negative side effects resulting from product and service sustainability. Immediate managerial implications from this study include the critical importance of simple corporate sustainable communication that does not require consumers to dedicate substantial cognitive resources. In other words, we want to make sure you don't think about it. We need to find a way to communicate these, these, uh, these pieces of soap, how they don't work, but we don't want you to know it. We don't want you to waste any brain space on it. So we want to basically find a corporate way of communicating it to you so you don't have to think about it at all. So how can we make sure you're not using up too much brain space when you use these products? One area that I find hilarious in this research is that a lot of people feel anxiety. They feel shame, guilt, and regret, according to the study. Or that they might be labeled a hippie or feminine, according to the research. Oh, if I use that, someone will call me a hippie. Or if I use that, eh, I'm a guy, people think I'm feminine. So if they use these shitty green products and they go talk, and so how can these companies then essentially hide the fact that these products are green using a process called green hushing. Like hush. So don't talk about the fact that your cream, uh, about your, your, your face cream, just, vo um, just f basically foist them on the unwitting public. Don't tell them that you're using sustainable, just sell it and don't even talk about it. That's the opposite of what companies do, like put natural on things right. that aren't natural at all. So now there's a backlash. Right. So here's part of the research. Important future research directions include the investigation of the side effects of green hushing and the development and testing of practical ways to help companies to avoid the sustainability liability trap, which leads to reduced demand because of sustainable features of products or services. So how do we hide this from the people they're basically asking? But also how do we avoid the liability? You see that right there? Avoid the liability trap. How do we avoid the liability that these products don't work and they break down and they may actually cause us harm? How can we protect our companies from this liability they're asking? Do, do, these, do many of these products even work at all? Turns out for not for very long, actually. 
A study looked into this deeply as it relates to housing, which brings us full circle back to our architects at the very beginning who are being asked to, f to like use this crap when they build. Here's the study. Why do green building enclosures fail and what can be done about it? Well, I don't, I think you're making a bit of a leap between like faulty dish soap. I'm just giving an example as an anecdote about how we're, we're told that these things are great for the environment. You'll feel better about your life. This is better for the waterways. When you actually add it up and you look at the CO2 emissions and you use the, the, uh, the additional amount of water that you're using, it's not good for the environment. In fact, it's the opposite. And as we see in this new study on green buildings, it's exactly the same thing. Any major problems they found, listen to this. So here's a building failures piece of this. It appears that these green building enclosures are not always durable. Indeed, there are reports in North America of many green buildings having suffered major building enclosure failures after only a few years. The results in environmental, economical, and social impacts that can reduce or negate the positive impacts of those green buildings. So among the major problems they found were moisture, mold problems, major structural problems uh, that caused parts of the building to collapse. One major example of this occurred in Maryland. You can take a look at this. This is the Philip Merrill Environmental Center. Take a look at this building. So uh, next one. We already did that one. Oh, oh, go back, go back. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So Philip Merrill Environmental Center it was touted as the first of its kind green building built with green materials supposed to use 57% less energy than a traditional building. Looks great. Just one big problem. It has many problems, actually. It suffered major building enclosure failures after only a few years. It costs hundreds of thousands of dollars to repair. So it turns out this building caused more damage to the environment than if it had been built with regular building materials in the beginning according to the study. And they looked at multiple buildings that had to be retrofitted in the same way and found the same thing. Here's an example, more CO2. When using CO2 as a measure, they found that 80 to 100 tons of CO2 was admitted to the atmosphere as a result of the increased material used associated with the building and envelope failures. It's easy to conclude that the buildings that required retrofitting of their enclosure before the end of their expected life expectancy can hardly be referred to as a sustainable building. Moisture is the biggest problem. Some of the expandable foam insulation products are examples of green materials that posed increased risks. The water absorption properties of these insulation materials can be quite different than what designers expect with traditional insulation. So take a look at this picture. Here's, here's an insulation problem. Um, there we go. Yeah, these are just some of the mold-based issues and insulation problems in the buildings. Here's the next one, a floor case study, blistering of the linoleum and floor and mold growth under the flooring material, the sustainable flooring material. So dark mold, black mold, they got to get all that out of there, redo all of that because of moisture. And so some of the things that they're using are things like potato chips, like skins of potatoes instead of wood, because they have a problem with wood. Instead of wood, they're using things like potato skins. So mm. they will compress potato skins, um, potato waste. Um, this is according to the McCann Institute or McCann Foods, a British frozen food company. They source their potato waste. They're being looked at as alternatives to current wood paneling. So turning chips into boards and soundproofing I if materials. You, if you still get termites, if it's not wood. Uh, but they probably just eat the chips. I mean, they, you would think, if, right? They just eat through the chips. Here's another one. Mycelium walls. Take a look at this. This is uh, mushrooms, right? Uh, as we learned from Philip the other day, mycelium. Yes. Um, this is uh, mycelium walls, lightweight, but you have to use abandoned houses with demolition waste. They combine that trash with blended mycelium mushrooms as a fungus called biocycling and to put these new materials together. You have another one called hempcrete. Hempcrete is actually um, pretty good, uh, although uh, there's still questions about moisture control and so forth. Um, and so all of these different building materials. So bottom line is, you're asking these architects to pledge allegiance to these climate gods and to put things in buildings that we still do not have a long track record that actually work. Um, and you're changing up entire professions based around a lot of lies, a lot of, a lot of climate propaganda. And uh, I think a lot of, a, a lot of climate agenda that still has a lot of problems. Okay. Um, but I mean, you have to start somewhere, right? That there's no, no harm in innovating, uh, you can but, innovate. but you have to, you know, we, we would hope that well, leave it up to the architect. Will, yeah. Leave it up to the architect to say, we don't have, 
we don't have enough track record on this mushroom based wall board. So I'm not going to recommend it for your, for your house. Yes. Right. Because, oh, maybe we don't know enough about the fungus in the wall and maybe your daughter has an allergy. Yeah. Is she going to be breathing fungus at night and she's going to cause her to have asthma problems because we don't have enough track record on this. Right. Or maybe again, they were spraying all of this insulation in people's homes. And if remember, we, we worked with the one builder in New Jersey who said, he said, they come out with this new stuff all the time and they just don't have enough track record on it. So the, all of the spray insulation where they're filling up all of the, the, yes. the cracks in the walls and stuff inside the inside for insulation. He said, and the problem is it was causing all of these homes to not breathe. Homes need to breathe. And he said, so they have this like sustainable insulation that's like foam insulation. And now the home is keeping moisture inside and causing all sorts of mold problems, causing people to have all sorts of breathing problems, respiratory issues yeah. and so forth. He's like, so they're pushing you to spray all this in spray insulation and it's not working. And then how do you go through? You have to go through the house and try to scrape it all out again to get right. it out of there. And these things don't scale to just fix. No. And it costs millions and it's more, more water more heat, more CO2 for the environment. So that's my take on that.